pacer or uh, versus defibrillator? Um, doctor would tell us. Yeah, thanks. So uh, for if somebody needs a pacemaker, uh, that part is fairly straightforward. If they have symptomatic bradycardia like anyone, they should get a uh, pacemaker. Uh, heart block, as I mentioned before, is common, particularly in trans that retin amyloidosis, it's common, and uh, patients will often, uh, often need a pacemaker. Um, defibrillator is a much tougher question. So traditionally, the feeling in patients with cardiac amyloidosis was not to place defibrillators. Um, and that was, uh, I think, for a couple of reasons. One was that in an era before effective therapies for both AL and transthyretin amyloidosis, uh, the prognosis was quite poor, particularly in AL amyloidosis. And the idea was, well, why would you want to convert what might be a peaceful sudden death into a more gruesome heart failure death with getting a bunch of shocks at the end of one's life? Also, it was found that it wasn't that infrequent that patients would get shocked uh, appropriately for ventricular arrhythmia and it wouldn't resuscitate them. Um, but again, that was when you would dive into the data that was largely putting defibrillators in patients who met the traditional primary prevention uh, indications for defibrillator, naming, namely EFs under 35%, and it was mainly in AL, in AL populations. And by the time you get to a very low EF with AL amyloidosis, you really have a quite terrible uh, prognosis, uh, not just from arrhythmic sudden death, but from uh, progressive heart failure. So uh, I, I think we and others then have uh, uh, looked at, well, if you uh, do it uh, a little more thoughtfully in terms of who you're putting the defibrillators in and not waiting uh, till meeting EFs below 35%, but pick a population who has a reasonable life expectancy, at, at the very least a minimum of a year, but hopefully uh, more than that, and B, try to uh, do it based on screening with ambulatory telemetry with something like a Xiopatch. And if they do have a significant burden of uh, ventricular tachycardia uh, on that, uh, we will typically offer defibrillators. Um, we've clearly seen higher rates of need for appropriate shocks in AL patients than transthyretin, so we're much more likely to recommend uh, for AL patients uh, uh, than uh, TCR patients, and then you want to time it with uh, their uh, camp, their chemotherapy that they're going to get. Uh, but I do think it is a, a big mistake to have a blanket uh, policy of we're just not putting defibrillators in patients or we're not putting primary prevention defibrillators in patients, because uh, uh, certainly I can say from our own experience, clearly it has saved a number of patients' lives uh, who've gone on to, in some cases, live for many years thereafter. If you guys, uh, just one thought, uh, John, before we move on. Um, if, if there is a need for AV junction ablation in these patients, have you moved to single chamber pacing or do you think biventricular pacing is a better option for these patients? I, I personally, we, we really try to avoid RV pacing uh, in general. Uh, and so either because of AV ablation or for compart block. Um, and uh, again, they won't necessarily meet the classic uh, indications for, uh, for CRT, but they, you're talking about uh, people with such impaired stroke volume, so with uh, uh, this, uh, ventricles with a great deal of diastolic dysfunction, that to add in the, the synchrony of RV pacing, uh, I think, is a mistake. Uh, uh, ventricular assist devices? Yeah, so um, we had some experience with putting in ventricular assist devices in patients with cardiac amyloidosis. We put in uh, six continuous flow, you know, the newer generation continuous flow left ventricular assist devices um, since in probably in the last 10 years with um, two of them being AL cardiac amyloidosis who were not transplant candidates. One was a lady in her 50s who had um, basically balloon pump dependent. There's a cohort of these AL patients that can go into cardiogenic shock from diffuse intramural coronary deposition, and actually their ventricles tend to not be small. They can be even normal to mildly dilated. And this particular patient was bailed out with a left ventricular assist device um, and actually lived four years, was receiving chemotherapy and lived four years, uh, the first three years being quite good, and then the last year having recurrent infections and complications. Uh, another AL cardiac amyloid patient was 75, again, presented the same way, balloon pump dependent cardiogenic shock, um, very toxic light chain levels, and we put in a hardware device, which is a continuous flow vet, and he's been, he's had it now for four and a half years. Um, he's had some complications, but he went on to get chemotherapy, and he's survived four and a half years. So those are the two longest survivals that we know of, 
And as far as TTR, we put them in two wild types and in two patients with the V122I mutation. And um, we, uh, two of those were bridged to transplant, which they were successfully bridged to transplant, and, and the other two uh, died at varying intervals. The 12, month, the 12 month survival was 100%. So I think it's feasible. The two biggest issues are, the biggest concerns are, what is the size of the LV cavity? As you know, patients with cardiac amyloid have sometimes smaller ventricles. Um, they certainly aren't dilated most of the time. So will the cannula and the left ventricular apex fit without impinging on the trabecular or the, or the walls? Are you gonna get a lot of suction events and arrhythmias? And also the fact that the RV is often dysfunctional and stiff, and will these patients have severe problems with right ventricular failure? Luckily, um, we have had um, not had those issues. However, we, we will, our, our typical rule is we will not implant a left ventricular assist device in a cardiac amyloid patient with a uh, LV end diastolic dimension of less than 4.4. That's kind of where we've gone, 4.4, 4.5. So I'm not sure uh, what we're doing at the Brigham. Dr. Desai, a, a short comment. Right. I, I would just make the argument that I think those are wonderful examples. I think in general, when we've looked at these patients, the number that meet those criteria is a relatively small fraction of the general whole. So I think on the whole, it's not a, a great strategy. I will say that the one thing that's helped these patients has been a transition in our listing system for transplant. And I think particularly for the TTR patients, isolated cardiac amyloid with wild type TTR or, or um, those patients uh, now are advantaged by a listing system that moves them up in the status uh, priority listing for uh, transplantation. And I think uh, obviates in some cases the need for VAD as a bridge to transplant. And so I think our direct to transplant strategy in those transplant eligible patients with amyloidosis is now increasingly possible and hopefully limits the need for sort of the out of the box thinking that, um, that Dr. Hanna has outlined, but it's wonderful to know the examples exist or the predicate exists uh, to do that uh, in, you know, when it's possible. And, and I just wanted, I wanted to say, I need, I need to make sure I emphasize that they are out of the box examples. I completely agree that this is not a strategy we should be routinely employing. And this is at, a, at very specialized centers and very specialized small percentage of cases.